Hello, and I want to welcome you to Tim at 12. And if you're watching me live, you know that this is a Friday and, and uh, this is an entire week where I'm doing a teaching on potent fasting and prayer. I'm talking about how to fast and pray from a biblical perspective and with the right motives and what this actually does for us. And this teaching that I've been giving you this week is not about the logistics of fasting or the medical uh, information involved with that. None of that you can discover all that on your own this is a bible study 10 and 12 is always a bible study so what i want to do is go into the word of god and see what the word of god says and that's what i'm doing again today in this final uh this final episode and the title of my episode today is corporate fasting for supernatural release corporate meaning a group of people doing it together and uh, and i believe that there's a supernatural release which we're going to be looking at in just a moment Today, I'd like for you to follow along with me because uh, almost every scripture I'm using is coming from the book of Joel in the Old Testament. So if you can get a Bible, open it up to the book of Joel, chapter number one, you'll be able to follow right along with me. But I believe that fasting is a lost key and it's found all through the Bible in the Old Testament as well as the New Testaments, yet for some reason it has seemingly been set aside and even misplaced by the church today. And this is a call for uh, for the church to wake up and to begin to re-engage the power of prayer and fasting. Now, at the very, the very first episode, I defined fasting, and really this is my personal definition, fasting is voluntarily abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. And the primary purpose for, uh, for biblical fasting is self-humility. It's to humble ourselves. Uh, yesterday, I talked about the, the measureless power that's released through fasting and prayer when it's done with the right motives and in accordance with Scripture. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, in part four, I talked about how that power can change not just individual lives, but it can change families, cities, nations, and even civilizations. Uh, in episode four, I talked about the city of Nineveh and what happened when Jonah came and they proclaimed a fast and how that, that city and that entire nation was impacted by that. Also, talked about Esther and the Persian Empire when the Jews called a fast and history was literally changed when a group of people humbled themselves before God through prayer and fasting. But it's important for us to know that fasting, prayer combined together, this is not something that is confined to the pages of the Bible. It's not just there in the past for us to look at. No, we, we can call forth powerful moves of God together today uh, through fasting and prayer. And, and I believe it's a desperate need, but it has glorious uh, possibilities. So again, today I'm talking about corporate fasting for supernatural results. And this is a really good lesson, especially for those who are in church leadership, but for everyone as well. And I want you to dig into this. So I asked you to open your Bibles to the book of Joel, Joel chapter number one. And first of all, we're going to take a look at Joel 1, 8 through 12. Now, here you're going to see a very desperate situation. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is a horrible situation that's happening in the land. And it's recorded here. It says, Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothal of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive the olive oil fails. Sounds desperate, right? Well, it gets worse. He says, despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. So here you see something that is negative. Uh, I'll go into more detail on it here in just a second, but it just sounds terrible. It, it, it's a negative circumstance. But God then reveals his remedy. And if you'll look down in Joel 1.13, you'll see the remedy there. Now he says, put on sackcloth. And again, just a reminder what sackcloth is. Sackcloth was something that they put on their bodies uh, on the exterior, which signified that they were in mourning or that they were humbling themselves because uh, sackcloth is very uncomfortable. And so uh, they, they were just saying, we don't want to feel comfortable 
comfortable right now. We want to feel uncomfortable so that we can deny our flesh. So that's what putting on sackcloth was, and it was a kind of an external thing that had a direct impact, okay? Uh, we don't practice that today, but there are different things that we can even do when fasting and praying, which helps us just to feel a little more uncomfortable so we can kind of wake ourselves up to, uh, to, to call upon God in the correct way. So he says, put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn, wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. And the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. That's the words right there. That's the important word. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all those who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So God's remedy for the problems, for the negative circumstances, is to set aside a time for corporate fasting and prayer. Now, Keep going here because he, he repeats this a little further on. So God's driving home the point. Joel chapter 2, if you look at verse 12, the Lord says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Your heart referring to your soul, your mind, your emotions, and your will. It's very, very similar to the word that's translated as flesh in the New Testament that we talked about in episode 3. Now, he, he talks about it again in Joel uh, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. So just look a few verses down. Here's the third time he's saying to, to do this. Blow a trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those who are nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom and leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, and this is the prayer that they should pray, uh, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? So, Again, this is a corporate fast. Now, first, just to just to take a look at the, the picture here, it's very important that we see here that the spiritual leaders lead the way with fasting and prayer. They're the ones who need to be upfront about all of this. And the others will follow their leadership. So people, they, they come to come together then to pray and to fast. Uh, a, a vast number of people, obviously, here. And there's a second uh, principle I see here. It is that they're doing this for an express purpose. It's not just because it's on the calendar or it's not not just because it's a it's it's kind of a nice thing to do. No, it's for a certain purpose, and it is to break a spiritual as well as a physical famine and to deal with the issue of pestilence in the land. Okay, so as I've looked through here in the book of Joel, the, the conditions are, are, are really clear. There's a lot of poetic language, very beautiful, very punchy. But, but just to put it into plain English, people were not bringing their offerings. They were also not coming to the house of God. So we see that as a spiritual famine. Also, the crops had failed through lack of rain. And, uh, and even the fruit trees, they were not bringing in physical, they were not bringing in fruit, which speaks of a physical famine. Uh, they speak of, of the pestilence which was had destroyed the crops so that that again speaks of disease or pestilence that was in the land and to top it off it, it says that the people had lost their joy now now what is joy well joy is this hopeful expectation of future blessing and deliverance but it's based upon the anchor of what God has done in the past but they didn't have any more joy so it's like they had forgotten what God had done in the past they didn't believe God could do anything in the future so there they had no joy so that is spiritual famine as well. So the prayer they were to pray was this, God, please intervene. God, work a miracle for us. The world is watching, uh, so show yourself to be mighty on our behalf. And, and they did this. And then the beauty is that God responds. And what I want you to do is I want you to make parallels into your own life, into your own setting, your own, whether it's family, church, or, or group or organization, and make these direct parallels based upon uh, the book of Joel. So here God responds. God responds in uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 23, and I'm going to read all the way down through verse 29. God says this. He says, be glad 
people of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God. So now what he's saying is here, let your joy be restored. And remember, again, joy, rejoicing always has to do with being anchored in the past because of what God has done and look forward to the future because there's there's blessing deliverance coming there. So no matter how things look at this moment, uh, you, you can turn around and rejoice. So he calls them, he tells them, it's time for you to rejoice, all right? Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you the abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be, and this is the future now, will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. And then he talks about all the different kinds of locusts. So this, this was pestilence. It says the great locusts, the young locusts, and the other locusts, and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders among you, and never again will my people be ashamed. So they, that was part of their prayer. That was part of their, their desire, their passion. They prayed for these things. God answers accordingly. It says, then you will know that that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and that there is none other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So, what he did is he promises here to break the, the physical and the spiritual famine and to, and to deal with the pestilence. And God's here just saying, I am coming to your help. There's going to be an overflow of, a, of abundance and, and I'm sending rain and provision. And, and, uh, and, and God then even uses this spiritual application of rain about uh, talking not only about physical rain, but now he says, but also I'm going to pour out uh, my spirit. It. So that breaks the spiritual famine. So, so if corporate fasting and prayer, it works. And God doesn't intend to leave us helpless and at the mercy of the forces of hell that ravages this world. No, he made a promise to pour out his spirit. But the condition is that we have to seek him with prayer and fasting, and it needs to be united and in a spirit of humility. Now, if, if you go back to Joel chapter 2, verse 28, he says, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Well, after what? It is after we have met God's conditions that were mentioned three times in the book of Joel. And then he will follow through. He says, then, instead of being fearful and defeated, you're going to be strong and effective. And, and the world is going to stand back in awe at how God comes through for his people. Now, we see here three classes of spiritual leaders that are called out uh, in the book of Joel. I'm not going to go into explicit detail on what all of these means, but these are all spiritual leaders. They're the priests, they were the ministers, and they were the elders. So, what this tells me is there's a desperate need for men and women of God who are in any form of spiritual leadership to lead God's people to the throne of God through prayer and fasting. Now we see this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. He says, uh, this, God, God says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and remember back from session one, we talked about this, the biblical method for humbling yourself is fasting, and it always has been Old Testament and New Testament. So it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, there's the fasting, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So this is, again, cause and effect. God wants to do this, but he, he gives us conditions. He says, you need to humble yourself. And, and it always begins with fasting and prayer. And biblical fasting always involves prayer and repentance and changes in our personal lives and fasting with the right motives according to the scriptures. And then God responds. So my prayer is that you will use this uh, teaching 
and you will apply it to your life and that you'll understand there is potency in fasting and prayer. And, uh, and, and not only on the personal level, as I shared in episodes one and two and three, but, but on, on large scale uh, levels. And if you're a leader, you need to lead people into fasting and prayer and you need to participate with this because something happens in the spirit of unity when God's people humble themselves through fasting and prayer. I hope you're engaging this and I hope you're doing it because this lost key of fasting needs to be reclaimed and you are the one who needs to begin doing it to reclaim it for the church of today. God bless you and I hope you'll join me for my next series that will be starting next week on Wednesday as I talk about real questions about prophecy, the end times and all kinds of things like that. Have a great week.